I was at the uh, local library and libraries are changing, they have to change. A lot of libraries are doing digital media and uh, I go to the library all the time to get things like DVDs and CDs and things like that. Um, but, you know, books are still high on my list and it's harder and harder to find certain books, especially um, technical books. So if you go to the technical section of the library, you can still find things that are kind of geared more at, I would say, kids, you know, maybe maker books or um, Arduino books or something like that. You might be able to find those. But you're not going to find hardcore technical books. Now, our library here um, in Silicon Valley, we had, um, it, at, the, at the city library, there were um, ways to be able to get books from other libraries and there was some type of sharing between libraries at the university level and it filtered down to the city library where you could actually ask the li city library to get you a book that was in the system and they would request it from a, a university um, and that worked for a while and then um, that agreement seemed to have disappeared. So there are some local colleges and universities that you can go use their libraries. Sometimes if you just sit down, you can use the library. I think at Stanford I can go in and sit down in the library. I can't check out books, but I can sit and uh, make copies and stuff like that. Stanford's a little too far away from me. Um, there's the closer, closer ones here. A lot of times you can actually check out technical books, but they tend to be on the old side because a lot of the new books are actually in e-book e format, and then you actually have to be a university student to be able to check out e-books and stuff. So it's becoming more and more difficult to, to get books at libraries. Um, anyway, got that off my chest. Um, but I was at the city library, and uh, at this front entrance to the city library, uh, is an actual book purchasing place where people donate books to the library and I guess if a book is important enough the library will put it on the shelf but a lot of times the donated books end up in this little shop and you can go buy books um, and so if you want to just buy I've bought uh, gardening books there, cookbooks, uh, travel books um, and then a lot of, I don't read a lot of non-fiction, <laughs> I mean, uh, fiction, fictional books, I, I read mostly non-fiction. Um, and oddly enough, this book was in the pile there for a dollar. All their hardbound books are a dollar, I think their softbound books are 50 cents. And it actually is a, uh, a book about 8085. Let me get you the title page here so it's probably easier to read. Um, uh, the uh, 8085 microprocessor. This book is still in print and it's actually gone through several revisions. This is revision 4, uh, fourth edition. I think it's up to sixth edition now. I'm not sure what date that is. This is the 1999 version. I think it came out in 19... Oh gosh, when did it come out? It's been around a long, long time. 1984 was the original. And uh, like I said, it's in the sixth edition now. It keeps getting updated. Um, out of the uh, State University of New York at Syracuse and it is a great book. So um, most people learn microcontrollers these days if you're doing kind of um, uh, hardware type development stuff you'll be using a uh, microcontroller. If you're doing software development you probably don't even care about the microprocessor you just buy something and it runs. So some type of single board computer or, or a tablet or something like that. Um, and if you actually want to learn the hardware, it's important to actually go look at a microprocessor, not a microcontroller. Microcontroller kind of hides a lot of the internals from you. Microprocessor kind of lays it all out there and it's up to you to do certain things. So. That's why this book is still in print and is still taught at many universities because it's very important to learn 
microprocessors if you're going to go on to do other certain things like design microprocessor microcontrollers you actually need to know how they work inside so it's a very good place to start and the 8085 is an excellent chip it's been my favorite chip for years and years and years it's very easy to use it's simple instruction set five volts only um, quite a simple chip uh, and it, it still works great and uh, there are a lot of single board computers uh, that I've shown in my videos. Here's one. Here's an 8085 uh, chip. Uh, people are actually still making them, making new ones. Uh, this was, uh, let's see here, if I can take off the top, top piggyback board. Just a second. <laughs> uh, it's got a large connector and it. it's hard to pull off. Here we go. So I think you're familiar with this board. Um, oh, this is a this is a Z80 board. I'm sorry, this is a Z80 board. This is a board that looks just like this. That's an 8085 board. I just don't have it in front of me. Um, but uh, anyway, a lot of people, uh, hobbyists and stuff, are still making boards for 8085s. Um, this is the G80 board. Um, I believe uh, there's an 8085 board that I did that was done by the same guy uh, who did the. Uh, uh, CPM version board. I don't even remember what that thing's called now. Um, but uh, he has an 8085 board. Anyway, it's still very popular. Still a great learning tool. Um, this book is quite thick. Uh, it's about an uh, inch and a half thick. Um, it's laid out really well. In the beginning, it talks about the architecture of the 8085. This should look familiar. Uh, demultiplexing the uh, address lines, the lower eight lines of, of the uh, processor are both address and data and you need to use something like a 373 or 573 to do the address decoding. Um, this should look familiar from a lot of the stuff I was doing on my S100 boards. You need to decode the addresses. So there's circuitry here that decodes the uh, addresses and then decodes uh, from the 8085 whether it's an I.O. operation or a memory operation and then whether it's a read or a write and so this little circuit then generates a uh, I.O. write signal and it's added with the uh, address so uh, you'll get an I.O. write only for this particular address and in this particular case it's it's to drive a seven segment LED um, so it's, it's pretty nice very, very laid out very simple to think about uh, then it goes into uh, programming um, gives you some very good rules to go by for actually generating programs that are well documented, um, actually doing a flowchart. A lot of times looking at assembly code is difficult uh, and having a flowchart is much nicer. Um, let's see here. Uh, interrupts, there's a good section on interrupts, uh, which is a really good place to start to learn what interrupts really do. Uh, the ADA5 is a uh, particular type of interrupt system, but it gets, gets you into the ideas of uh, what, what do interrupts do, how does the microprocessor handle it, how do stack operations work during interrupts and things like that. So it's, it's quite good for that. Um, let's see. Good section on interfacing it to peripherals. Um, in this particular case, it's a, a D to A converter. Um, a lot of times you'll be using I squared C or, or, or spy interrupt, you know, some type of serial communication these days. Um, but if you have a bus configuration, you actually need to use an 8-bit device and you need to do the decoding and things like that. So it uh, gives you good or examples of things like that. Um, it goes into some of the more common peripherals, the like the 8255. I think we've seen that ad nauseum on my channel. Uh, but there's the 8155. Um, actually, I think the one before this was the the 8155, which adds a timer and some stuff. We saw that board on uh, some other things. Anyway. It also goes into serial communications, the uh, 8251, which can be a bit confusing, so this is a good chapter to talk about uh, serial interfacing. 
and uh, actual RS-232 level conversions like a MAX-232 chip and things like that. Um, in the back there's some nice appendice appendices on uh, actual uh, data sheets for some of the parts like an 8259 uh, which is a I believe that's the uh, uh, interrupt controller I don't know if I'm remembering it correctly um, well, maybe not 8259 yeah interrupts um, and the 8255 there's a very nice section here on talking to Hitachi controllers for LCDs um, so the 44780 series uh, very nice section here on uh, how you do the initialization, how you can create uh, certain characters or underscores and things like that. Um, and then uh, in the back is a good um, section on each 8080-8085 instruction. How it operates, how many actual cycles of processor time it takes M cycles, T states, what the hex code is, uh, how many bytes the operation takes up, um, how it works, which flags were affected during the operation of the uh, instruction and stuff. So it's a very nice section for all of the instructions of the 8085, um, which is exactly the 8080 uh, plus a couple more. Um, and then there are some of the questions. It is a textbook. Uh, some of the questions have answers in the back. Um, anyway, very nice book. Cost me a dollar. Um, put it on my shelf. Probably never read it again. <laughs> but uh, it was absolutely brand new. Not a mark in it. And I, for a dollar, I just had to have it.